Hi everyone, in this video we will see how to set up Flutter in our system. So for that, you just need to open the, any browser which you use, Mozilla, Chrome, Edge or Internet Explorer. Then just search for the Flutter install. Flutter install. So first link which you are seeing over here, Flutter or Dev. So it's basically a documentation done by Flutter. So it will show you how to set up a Flutter in your system. So first you need to select which operating system do you use. Windows, Macintosh or Linux. So I have Windows. So I will select Windows over here. And first is showing the, all the system requirements which is required like operating system. Operating system should be Windows 7 or later and 64 bit. Disk space should be 400 MB. And tools should be Tools should be included like PowerShell 5.0, which is already installed in a Windows 10. And Git for Windows, Git for Windows is required. Once you install it, after it, suppose any update comes, it will pull from the repository of the Git. So that's why it requires Git for Windows. So please install Git for Windows if you are using Windows 10, and please check if you have 400 MB of space. Then just press this. So it will give a prompt of downloading it. So just take it, save it, and save it, save this. But I will not be doing it because I already have it in my system. After that, you just need to unzip it and then place it in place it into the local disk C SRC in Flutter. You just need to create one new folder in local disk C with the name of SRC and unzip the Flutter which you Flutter is stable which you download from over here into this folder or you can clone the repository directly into the SRC system in the SRC folder basically. So you just see like that's that it has is Windows C like Windows C is like basically my local disk C you need to go into SRC and in this I have placed the Flutter the stable which I downloaded it the SDK. Then after that, you need to set the environment variable path. So for that, you need to search environment variable. Yeah, edit the environment variable. You will have something option like that. Just press enter. Environment variables. Then over here. In path you need to edit Microsoft in no, the system variables. Yeah, in this path you need to add like flutter src dot bin c src flutter bin. You just need to add something like that. Place clone in then c src flutter slash bin. Basically, is the path where we have placed a flutter SDK. So after that, you need to download Android Studio and VS Code. Once you download it, you need to go into VS Code, go to extensions and search for Dart and Flutter extensions. So in my system, Dart and Flutter extensions are already downloaded. So in this place, you will have the install button. Just install that, both Dart and Flutter. For Android Studio, you need to, open, you need to go to Files, Settings, then you need to select the plugins. Over here, you need to search Dart. In my system, it's already installed. That's why it's showing installed. You in your place, it will be showing something like this: install. You need to just click on that. It will it will install directly. So once all of these things are done, just open Command Prompt CMD. And run Flutter Doctor. If your system is perfectly, if your Flutter is perfectly been set up in your system, it will show you all the text without any error. If there is any error, it will show you like what to do, how to fix it. Like suppose your Android license is not verified, it will show you which command to run. Then you need to accept the license. Then it will work. It will show you the tick. So anything, if you have any problem, just search for it.
So it's basically showing like Flutter is properly installed, Android toolchain, develop Android device is already perfectly installed with the version 29.0.2. The Android Studio has been perfectly installed, VS Code is perfectly installed. It should exclamation mark with the connected devices because there is no connected devices to my system right now, that's why. But Flutter has been successfully installed. Once I connect to it, any devices, it will show it take over here, over here also. So with this, we are done with the Flutter installation. Thank you. Hello everyone. So in this video, we'll be starting by creating our first Flutter application. I'll be using Visual Studio Code, but you can also use Android Studio. So for creating your application, Press the keyboard shortcuts, Ctrl, Shift and V, select Flutter new project, name your application. So I will be writing it as first Flutter project, save it in the desired location and then you will see the visual code would automatically be creating a lot of iOS as well as Android files in the left hand side. See, so the Android has a lot of build.gradle, the manifest file, and iOS also had a lot of info.blessed files, related files. You'll also see something called pubspec.yml. So you see, it's very important for our Flutter application because it has the name of, of our application, the description, the version, and also in case you import a lot of external libraries to your application, you'll be writing their versions as well as everything here side to make sure that they are implemented in the application also all the images if you want to add images to your file or if you want to image add any type of font in your file you have to add here to make sure it is implemented in the application so pubspec.yml acts like a backbone and it contains all the type of fonts or external libraries or anything that you want also in dependencies you will see something called as cupertino underscore icons so what is this for so this basically contains a lot of icons which are to be used in the flutter application which are compatible with both android as well as ios so you don't have to worry about importing everything and adding images here you can also add icons from the inbuilt icons which are present here okay apart from that we have two dart files so we don't need the visual underscore test so i'll be deleting it in the main dot dart you will see there are a lot of things so first of all there's importing some packages there's some functions some class and also a lot of comments for us to understand what this board is all about so we'll be starting from scratch and removing all of that so let's start with our code now so first of all i'll be importing the package which package is it? So it's the material package. What material package is? Basically, it contains all the material design. So material design is something which contains all the rules and the constraints which are there for us to display the application in web as well as Android or iOS. So material design takes care of all of that. Then, as you if you have studied Java before, you know that inside a class there's function called void main. So it acts as the entry point to the Java code that, that you have written. Similarly, there's a similar function void main, which acts as an entry point to our application. Inside this, all you have to do is write another function, which is run app. So what run app is? So run app is another entry point, or as you can say that inside the void main function, the first or the most priority is given to the run app function. So whatever is written inside the run app will get implemented first. Okay. So in the run app, I'll be writing a code for displaying a simple text on the screen. So text will be displayed using a simple widget known as text. Inside this, it accepts string values. So I'll be writing this is my text. To see what's the outcome, all you have to do is debug and go to debug with Dart and Flutter. Here you can see the application or the phone uh, where do you want to run the application on an emulator or in the phone. But make sure when you're using an emulator, 
you have to download it first and also in case of mobile phone make sure there is debugging enabled in your phone application so let's see what is the outcome after some time so for running this application there are two ways first you can use your phone and run this application on your phone or else you can also download your emulator and run on that so in case you want to use your phone all you have to do is go to your phone about device and then click on your build number for 10 times this will enable another option called developers option in your phone there you also have to enable usb debugging so whenever you connect your usb to your laptop and then your phone you will be able to download your application in your phone and then run it otherwise in case of emulator you can go in the fourth option run and debug and select run and debug dart and flutter so here you will see two options first is the name of emulator if case you have any and the second is the name of the device in case you are connecting it through a usb so you can select either of them so on running this you can see that there's a huge error here present which says no directionality widget found well this is because first of all we haven't defined any structure for our application and then we have only defined a text which says this is a text so we haven't defined how should this text be displayed or where should we put in the application etc so according to the error we'll add something called text direction now this takes two types of values one is ltr and the second is rtl so ltr is left to right and rtl is right to left so i'll be using ltr which is the most common one so on running this you can now see that our text is being displayed in the top left corner well now the whole screen is black and there is no orientation of how and where should the text be displayed so we'll be adding some proper structure to our application so first of all i'll be introducing another widget known as material app so material app plays a very important role in defining the primary color or the secondary color of your application so in case you have done native application before you'll notice that there is something called primary and secondary color for each application so material app can be used for this also also there's something called title and while typing title you can see that it accepts only a string type of value so i'll give my title as my flutter app and then give the home as the text that we declared earlier don't forget to close your brackets so on running this you can see that the text which was being displayed in the top left corner which was very small earlier is now big enough in a red color and also with a yellow underline this is proper than how it was displayed earlier but still we don't want our application to look like this when the user clicks on it or opens it so to change some more orientation i'll introduce another widget which is known as scaffold so scaffold acts like a boiler plate for your code so on pressing control space you can see there are multiple options present like app bar background color bottom navigation bar body drawer etc so scaffold basically defines a structure of your application so using scaffold you can add an app bar a navigation bar so navigation bar is used to navigate through all the pages of your application so all of this can be coded by using scaffold widget so i'll add an app bar by using app bar widget itself now it has a title and it accepts a widget type so i'll write text and then title and then i'll also add a body to our application and insert the text there so on running this let's see what's to change so earlier we had a black screen with a red text but now we have an app bar and a body which is very promising now we have to understand the difference between the title that we gave in the scaffold and the title that we gave in the material app so when we wrote title in the app bar it is being displayed here so what about the title that we wrote in material app so when you press this button which shows all the present applications in your phone you will see that whatever title that i wrote here my flutter app is being displayed here so the title that we write in material app is used to show the text whenever your application is in background state so we prefer our title to be very small whenever it's in material app so that it doesn't take much of the space 
also in app bar also we prefer our title to be very small because more of the application and information should be shown in the body itself now i don't want my background color to be white but something else so this scaffold i can change it by using background color and give another color like colors or yellow so colors is an inbuilt thing which we imported when we were importing this package material dot that so on running this you can see that the background color which was white earlier is now yellow in color so you can similarly use many other colors other than yellow so there are many inbuilt colors like amber black blue cyan orange etc so other than displaying the text i also want my text to be displayed in the center so i'll use center widget close the bracket so we can see that now our text is being displayed in the center of the screen so this is what center widget does it displays our text in the center of the screen so this is all about this video we learned about how to we create our first product project and also we learned about many basic widgets like run app material app and scaffold which are very crucial for building our application we also learned about the different titles which can be given in our application and about the center and text widget which can be used to change the appearance of our widgets so we'll learn something new in the next thank you hello everyone so in this video i'll be talking about how can you organize your code as well as try changing the code and uh, trying to send that to other location and check if there's any change in the app or not so first of all what we can do is instead of writing our all the functionalities in the void main we can create a class so i would like to name my class as my class and the convention says that you have to name your class and the first letter is always to be capital then it should extend something which is known as stateless widget not exactly stateless widget so stateless widget is something that uh, that is stateless so it doesn't change its states whenever the application is running or throughout the application whenever it is to be used or not the class on which it will be used so the container or the data which is inside this class will not change its state or the data that it is containing anywhere in the application you can see a red line here so all i have to do is click here and then click on the bulb and you will see something like create one missing override so on clicking this uh, the visual studio will automatically be creating a function for me which is known as build and the return type is a widget so what we can do is whatever is written inside the material app it can be taken and it can be returned here instead because even material app returns a widget so see so my class has a function build which will be returning a widget which is exactly like material app okay so what here can we do is we can call my class we can also use the new keyword but since this is new flutter version so you don't have to write new every time you're calling something even without writing the new keyword you can always call them so let's see if there's any change in our application till now okay so there's no change very now let's try doing something else so as you can see that inside the run app there's nothing much inside the void main the run app contains just a single line which is my class when it's calling the class and also the void main has just a line of function which is run app so what we can do is use expression functions what expression function does is instead of these brackets we can use fat arrow fat arrow is equal to sign and this arrow so instead of using parentheses all the time for a single line of code you can use the fat arrow and even though then the code will be running exactly the same see there's no change so you can also see in the top right corner there's a red banner which spells as debug so it obviously doesn't look very nice so we would like to remove that what we can do is in our material app just 
press control and space and you'll see a list of options and here you'll see something known as debug show check mode banner on setting it as false what you are doing is you're telling your flutter or your dart that you don't want the banner to be displayed so keep it as false so see now the top right corner is free of the banner which was present earlier so this was all coding using a single dart file now let's try doing all of that but using two dart files so what i'll do is in the lib i'll create a new file and name it as second file also the naming convention here follows that you have to start it with a small letters and also have an underscore in between so in second file similarly i'll import a package which obviously will be material design so material or flutter great and i'll be naming this class as my second class again second class being with capital letters and this class should also extend stateless widget for now there is again an error what you will do is create a function which is built and which should be returning some which should be returning something okay so what i'll do is take the body from here and return in return it in the second file remove the comma okay so after the second file is done completely what i'll do is in the main dot dal i'll be calling this class which is second class so in the body i'll be writing second class and as i'm typing it you can obviously see that it is automatically importing the package which is second file or dart so i'll be clicking it and it is automatically imported so let's see if the application works the same or not this is still the same and to check once more all we can do is change the text here so we can write this is it Let's see if the change is visible here. See, so it is perfectly fine. The second underscore file dot dart is visible in the screen itself. It also still has a title, which is my Flutter app, which was given in main dot dart. Okay, so in this video, all we uh, did was first of all managing how can we write less number of code and uh, not write everything and clutter everything and void main. So we can use classes for the same which extends stateless widget or stateful widget about which we'll be learning in the later videos. Also about the debug show checker mode so that there is no banner which is present in the top right corner. It's not there anymore. Also by creating other Dart files and calling them and ensuring that there's no change in the application itself. So this is it for now and in the next video we'll be adding some logic to our code so that because all of this that we started right now is all about presentation but the code also has to have some logic so let's try to do that in that next lecture thank you hello everyone so in this video we'll be adding some logic to our code Till now, all we have done is added some text, some color or some title bar to our application. But our code also needs some logic to work upon. So in this, what we'll be doing is generating some random numbers between say 1 to 20. Whenever a user opens our application, he or she will be displayed with random numbers which are between 1 to 20. So for that, we'll be creating another function. And we can name it as uh, generate numbers. The return type of generate numbers will be int integer. Like the generate numbers, what we can do is define a variable which is r is the random side, okay, and then define another define an integer which will be taking that random value. So that will be r dot next int. And the maximum value will be twenty because we want the random numbers to zero to twenty then we can return an int so we can return the i which is to be displayed here so what we'll do is in the text section we'll be writing random number and 20 is and then 
we can call a function which is we can call a function which can be called using a dollar sign and the brackets so they will be generate numbers okay so let's see if this works or not great so whenever you're opening the app there's a random number which is 30 so let's see if it changes whenever i reopen the application On rerunning the application, the random number between zero to many. Okay, so it becomes six right now. So it's it changing. What else can we do is instead of writing this whole thing here, we can also write this and get it returned from the generate numbers itself. So it will be returning not a string, but not an int, but a string. So we can return all of this. and is for calling the value all we have to do is a dollar sign and inside the brackets you have to write the i and here we'll be calling the generate function generate number sorry okay so let's see if this still works yeah great so the random number generator now is 8 and on rerunning the application the number changes from 8 to 2 great so in this video all we have learned is using some logic and uh, by creating another function known as generate numbers which returns certain values like string or int but there is some text which is not statically everything but is changed even in every time your application is open and yeah so let's see something else in the next video Hello everyone, so in this video, we will be starting by learning some of the basic widgets which can be used in Flutter. So we have already learned about what is an app bar and how can we add a title to the app bar. So now let's see how can we add some icons as well as additional text to the app bar. So go to the app bar widget and press control and space. You will see a list of attributes which can be used. So the first one says actions widget and the input is list of widget. So let's try to add an icon here. For adding an icon, type icon with i capital and inside that icons with i capital. And as in when you press the dot, you'll see a list of inbuilt icons that are already present. So out of these, I'll select settings. So let's see what difference does it make. Okay, so in the top right corner, you'll see a settings icon. So similarly, you can use any icon and uh, try to implement something like whenever you click this icon, the user of the application is taken either to the user profile app or the logout page or similar like this. Okay. Similarly, let's try to add some additional text here. So there's something called bottom attribute which takes preferred size. Inside preferred size, I can add the child as some text which says this is a text in app bar. App bar. Okay. So after running this, you'll be able to see a text which is in the app bar and present at the down of title which was already written. So since the app bar looks kind of small right now, so let's try to add increase its height. So there's something called preferred size attribute enter size dot from height and it accepts um, float type of value so I'll enter 40.0 so you see after doing this the height of the title ex uh, and along with the icon as well as the text so in all the whole app bar increases so this is how you could increase the height of the app bar after all this, you'll also see a slight shadow here downside the app bar. So let's see how can we change that. So in app bar, there's something known as elevation. So let's try to keep the elevation 0.0. .0. It is also a double value. 
So on entering 0.0, you will see that the shadow is completely gone. So what do we understand is by the elevation attribute, we can add shadow to the app bar so that it kind of feels elevated. So on keeping the elevation is 10, you will see. Okay, so the shadow returns back. So basically elevation helps in giving amount of shadow so that we can control how our app, app bar looks in the application. Similarly, we can keep the title as center. So for that, I can use center widget and inside that keep the child as the text itself. On doing this, you can see that the title now is centered. Okay. So in this video, all we learned was how to add some icons as well as additional text in the app bar. So you can always display some additional information or important information in the app bar itself. And also how you can keep the title in the center and control how your app bar looks by using the elevation attribute of the app bar widget. Thank you. Hello everyone, so in the last video we saw how can we add text to the app bar and also some icons and some other important values in the bottom of the app bar. So now what we will be doing is, uh, you see in the body part there is only a simple text with a yellow background. So in case I want to separate my text or separate my body into specific parts or uh, sub parts, I will be using some other widget for the same. So in the second file, I'll be introducing another widget, which is known as container. So as the name itself explains, container basically divides your page into parts. So here, instead of center, I'll be defining another widget, which is called container. Inside the container, there's child. And I'll be... there is no change that is present here so in the container container has a lot of attributes which includes height and width and they accept double type of value Inside height i'll give 300 and width also is 300 maybe give it a six okay. on running the yellow part is now only 300 in width and 500 in height so it doesn't take all of the screen but only a part of it and that was because we use container of a specific height and width now in case i want to change the alignment of the text present here so all i have to do is there's an alignment tag here alignment attribute and it accepts alignment type of widget so inside alignment 0 comma 0 now 0 comma 0 will be center so you'll see there'll be no evident change here. But in case I want to display my text in the top as minus one comma minus one, you'll see there's still no change in the position of the text. Why is that? Well, that is because inside the container we have used center and we wanted the text to be inside center. So the text is eventually accepting center as its alignment and not the alignment which is given by the container. So first of all, we'll have to remove the center so that the alignment given by the container is, is accepted. And now the text will be moving according to the alignment which we get. So the my, according to minus 1 and minus 1, x and y axis respectively. So the text is now in the top as well as in the left side. So you can similarly change the alignment and stuff. So after alignment, I also want to change the color of the background. So I'll be giving color. And we've already seen that we how have we given the color yellow? All we have to do is colors dot sum, then the color name. So I've used colors dot green. See, the background now changes to green color. Now I don't want my important information or information like this to be typed all of it here. I want it to be in a single file as a global file where I can always, you know, take values from it. So what I'll be doing is in the LIB, I'll be 
I'm declaring or I'll be creating a new dat file which will be util.dat. Util stands for utility. So whatever utility like important text, file or colors that I want, I'll store it here globally so that everywhere it's accessible. Okay, so first of all, I'll be importing my material file. So that's very important in every page. Then I will be declaring a color. So that's color purple. That's can be declared as colors dot purple. It's fine. It's all. Uh, it's already that you have soon seen earlier. Now I'll be writing something for a dark purple color. So what I want is, in case you know the hex code or the value, I can always type that. So inside color and not colors inside the bracket. At first, you always have to type zero x and capital two times f. Then you can add the hex code. So that is, in my case, I'm adding purple, so it's double eight zero e four f. So double zero x double f eight eight zero. Okay, fine. So this is the color that I want to display. Now also instead of y, you can also display it as constant because you always want the value to be constant. Now also Flutter has something interesting which is say suppose I want a lighter shade of purple that's already defined here. Light color purple, I want colors not purple. And when I put my cursor here on purple, you see there are a lot of shades which are given already here. So it's purple 50, 100, 200, 300. In case in case I only type colors dot purple, it's it's this darker shade. In case I use 600, it gets darker. But in case I use 400, 300 or less of that, it gets lighter. So I'll be using 300 here. 300. And okay, so these color codes are already saved here. And whenever it is perceived, it is already shown in the left hand side. So all I want to do right now is use it in my second file. So here I'll use color or maybe light color, purple color. Light color purple is now visible and also the dark will be automatically importing this field. So let's see if it's there any change from green color. So the purple color is now visible as you wanted it to be. So these are like uh, three types of how you can define colors. And uh, you can similarly not use purple but any type of hex code if you want or any, even uh, dart and platter has a lot of inbuilt colors. You see their accents amber, black, blue, brown, cyan a lot of colors present here you can always use them so if we have colors we also know something which is called gradients so gradients is basically a mixture of different different colors which can be used to display a more um, attractive way so in case you want to use not a single color but many colors so there's another attribute which is already present in container so what container has is called decoration and decoration accepts box decorations inside the box decoration i want to apply some gradients it's already present a gradient now also it has a lot of type of gradients so they can be linear radial or swing so i'll be using a radial gradient for the same for the radial gradient first i always have to choose some colors the colors have to be in a list so I'll choose colors dot green, then colors dot blue, colors dot orange, and some colors dot pink. Okay. So the colors are now set here, but you always want your gradient to start from somewhere the color part to start from somewhere and then end somewhere. So I'll be writing stops. So stops are basically to stop the color. So say suppose I want to stop the green at somewhere. So it accepts double point value. So I'll be writing 0.2, then 0.5, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16,
0.7 and 1. So all the value ranges from 0 to 1. So the color has to stop somewhere from 0 to 1. So since there were 4 colors, there are 4 stops similarly. Now for the center alignment of whole of that thing from x axis to be 0.1 and y axis to be 0.3. Alignment is always between minus 1 to 1. So any value between minus 1 to 1 in x and y axis always are used in alignment. And I want the focal to be around. So in, again in alignment, I'm using the focal to be minus 0.1 and then so I guess this will be it for displaying uh, how I want. Also, once you run it, okay, so you see a lot of error. Why is that? Because you, know, you can already read from here that you cannot provide both a color and a decoration. So since a decoration box can always have a background color, it provides a gradient and not what all. So either you can have a background color defined by the color attribute or a decoration. So I'll be removing this color. there's a beautiful spiral gradient which is present here the green color starts from the center till point 0.2 the blue color from point 0.2 to point 0.5 and there's orange from point 0.5 to point 0.7 and the light shade of pink which is present from point 0.7 to 1 so all of that completes our look and this is how we can use a radial gradient you can also use a sweep gradient or a linear gradient for the same and i would like my text to be displayed in the center it will look better so i'll give it zero comma zero the text to display in the center quite nice so it's good okay so now what i want is this was all about displaying some um gradients and displaying some text what i want is in case now i click on this text some message should be shown on the screen so what I'll do is, there's something which is known as gesture detector. So a gesture detector is present. So inside the child text, I'll be defining something known as gesture detector. Inside a gesture detector also has a child. So let it be the screen text which we used earlier. Okay. Now the gesture detector should also do something. So on. So there are a lot of things we can do on double tap, on force press N, horizontal drag, long press, pan N, pan start, scale, tap, vertical and whatnot. So I'll be using on tap. So on tap, it should define a function. So on tap, what I want to do is define a function by using brackets and then curly braces. Inside curly braces, I want to show some of that random, you know, black text which we get at the bottom of the screen so in here we call them as snack bar so for calling a snack bar the function is simple all you have to do is dot of context the context is automatically taken from the build widget so build context it provides the context here also and then snow snack bar so i'll be creating a snack bar so that will be new snack bar the content that um, it was pressed and I want the duration so I want the duration to be so I can define them in days, hours, microseconds or milliseconds so i'll give it in seconds maybe two seconds is enough of time okay and all I, and also i have to close the function by a semicolon so let's see if it makes any difference or not okay so this is the text in case i click here you see i got a snack bar at the bottom which is place it was pressed so gesture detectors can be basically used everywhere you can also use it here 
when we talked about app bar we also had some icons right so in case you want to display some logout option or the user information you can always use gesture detectors on the app bar or any widget that you want something to do after it is tabbed or any action that is performed on it so you can always display something like snack bar you can go to pages or you can change the values here maybe and uh, so that's it so in this video all we have learned is basically first of all use of containers which can be used to divide the pages also its various attributes like color and decoration so decoration can be used to give a gradient effect or any type of gradient effect that you want here then about gesture detectors which are basically used to detect your gesture so that whenever you click an icon or something a change is displayed in your screen like a snack bar thank you Hello everyone, so in this video, I will be introducing some new widgets which can be used in Flutter. So in the earlier video, we created this text and when we click on this, a snack bar was displayed. So you see the text is not quite visible. So I will like to make some changes to the text widget. So inside the text widget, press Ctrl and space to see more options. Choose style which accepts text style widget. Text style inside that I'll give some color so color can be colors dot white you can also define your color in util dot that which was created earlier okay so after color I like to increase its size so let's see if there's anything like font okay so your font family which can be used to give different type of fonts I'll use font size and give the font size as 15.0 because it accepts double type of value then in font weight I'll give the font weight dot bold so that it appears to be a bit bold so you see now the text is white in color as well as bigger in size and bolder so this is how you can improve the visibility of your text now, in all of this, we have only worked with a single container. What if we want to work with multiple containers and different patterns? Say, suppose you want to align them horizontally or vertically. So, let's see what Flutter has for it. So, first of all, let's clear all of this so that there's not much data to be viewed. have a yellow color container I like to remove this container so that the color so that there is no confusion and give this a color which was light purple now this was already given before so as of now we only have a container which is of light purple color so let's try to add two to three containers in a row. So in a row it accepts children and this accepts a list of widgets. So I'll be adding a container. So after adding a container inside it, I'll also be adding another container. Whose height will be similar to this. So it will be 500.0. And width will be 100.0 and give it a color so colors dot give let's see how is this aligned right now okay so you see that right now the two containers are in a row with hardly any space in between so what can we do is inside a row we have another attribute called main axis alignment so what main axis alignment does, it defines different type of spaces which can be used. So the containers which are inside a row can be in center, end, can have space around them, can have space between them and can have space evenly. So space evenly means that equal amount of 
padding or margin will be given to the containers or the widgets that you are writing, writing inside a row or a column or as well as tab. So let's try space between and see if we can figure out any difference. Okay, so using space between you see the containers do have a space in between them. On using space around, okay, so on using space around, what you will see is they have a space in between, but also they have a space after on the left as well as right side of them. So the difference between space around and space between is that space between only takes care of the space between the widgets that are defined in a row. But space around also creates a space on the left as well as right. So the both the sides have some amount of space between them. You can also use start in case you want the widgets to start from the left hand side of the application. See, so now they are aligned at the start. And similarly, you can use center or end. So now let's try to align them in a column instead of a row column and the main axis alignment is still start here so you will see that the containers are now aligned in the top but there is an overflow here well that is because the combined height of the container the two of the containers is much bigger than the size of the screen of the emulator or the mobile that you are using so we can figure it out later but right now, let's decrease the height of the containers. And see if it helps. Great. So now the containers have 50 50 height, and also they are aligned in the top because they are, their main axis alignment is start. Let's try space between. Now you can see that there is a space in between the columns, the containers which are defined inside the column. So you can similarly use space between, around or evenly for the same. So this was all about column. Now let's talk about the problem that you faced earlier when the height was 500 and 500. So what I can do for solving this is I can define the column inside another widget which is called single child scroll view and give the child as the column itself and close the bracket here and let's see if we can find any change so you will see the problem is now resolved and also you can scroll through the containers that you have defined inside the column. So what single child scroll view widget does is basically defines that whichever child is defined inside this widget becomes a single child and the users can scroll through the single child. So you can easily scroll using a emulator as well as your application. You can add containers inside a column and also add icons or anything else like uh, so let's try to add an icon okay so you see now the icon and the two containers are in column with each other so this is how you can use row or column to align different objects or different widgets in a horizontal or in a vertical fashion uh, well this is it about this video and let's study something else in the next video. Thank you. Hello everyone. So in this video, I'll be talking about two commonly confused widgets that are used in Flutter. One is flexible and the other is expanded. Flexible is used to recite the widgets used in rows and columns. So we have already seen in the previous video how can we use row and column widget in Flutter to align our data in a horizontal or vertical fashion. So what we can do is define any widget like container, 
text or icon inside the flexible widget so that after that the flexible widget will take care of how to present that widget inside the screen whereas expanded is used to fill the available spaces present around the widget so whenever you have to align different size and height of containers in a row or column you will see there is some amount of extra space which is present around them so what expanded widget does is basically take all that space and combine it with the main data which is present inside the container or the widget that you're using and display it in an appropriate manner now flexible is mainly used to adjust the space present around it so flexible has certain attributes like flex fit or tight or flex fit or close and many other to make sure that the size of the widget that is inside the flexible is properly maintained according to how the user wants it to be also you will see that whenever you wrap a container inside expanded and when you wrap another container inside flexible with another property like flex fit dot tight you will see that both of them show a very similar property of the managing the space as well as displaying the appropriate data inside it also in case you've used native development before you will see that flexible acts a lot like wrap content and expanded acts a lot like match parent what wrap content does is basically it aligns your data without any extra space around it whereas match parent takes the height and width of the whole parent so no matter how large or how small your widget is the widget inside expanded will take the whole amount the whole height or width of the container in which it is present now flexible can be changed using fit and expanded can be changed using flex so greater the amount of flex value given to a container the greater amount of space will be taken by that container so to demonstrate all of this let's move on to the code now so i have already written some amount of code so first of all i have defined a column and inside that column i have defined three different rows so one row has an expanded and a flexible widget the second row has both of them as flexible widgets and the third row has both of them as expanded widgets so for expanded all i have done is defined a container inside expanded and given some text in the expanded similarly in flexible i have defined a container with a different color in flexible and given some text inside it so you will see that on implementing this flexible is taking only the amount of space that is required to write flexible whereas expanded is taking almost all of that space so two expanded are taking around half of the width of the screen of the emulator so in case you want to change the amount of space these two expanded are taking all you can do is change their flex so in expanded give the flex is 1 to the first container and give the flex as 3 to the second container also you can change the color to see a more visible change on implementing this you will see that the first container which has flex of 1 has taken only 1/4 of the screen whereas the second container which is red in color has taken 3/4 of the screen and well that is because it has greater flex value that is 3 and the smaller one has a smaller flex value which is 1 so similarly you can use flex fit or tight or you loose in flexible widgets to control the amount of size of the container that is being taken by both of them so this is all about this lecture we'll learn something new in the next thank you Hello everyone so in this video we'll be learning what are list views in flutter so list views are basically used to display a list of all the similar things so they can include a list of all the animals present around you or the stationery that you have etc so let's try to create a list view in flutter so type list view widget and inside that you have to write children widget which accepts a list of widgets so i can use text 
dog and another text which has cat. So let's see what's the change. So on running this you will see we get a list of the items that we have already written here. Now in case you want some structured list to be displayed we can use another widget which is known as list style. The list style has certain properties. One of that is title. So inside the title you can write dog and you can define another list style. As a title of cat. And you can also keep the text here just to get a comparison. So, on doing this, so you can see the dog and cat are now being displayed as list style here, and the cat is somehow a bit smaller. So, you can see the list style is already has some attributes inbuilt in it due to which there is a lot of padding as well as margin around dog and cat so in case you want to display something else on the left of dog or cat you can use some attribute which is known as leading now leading accepts any widget so instead of text i can give an icon so type icons dot any icon and similarly define for cat and instead of this use the second one on running this you can see on the left side there are two more icons which are being displayed that we have defined in the leading itself and now also since you can also define something in the left you can also define something in the right now that is defined using trailing and similarly you can add any widget so I'll add another icon On implementation you will be able to see another icon on the right side of dog and cat which we have defined here in trailing see so you now have the access time icon in the right side of dog and cat also after you define your list in case you want to add some more description to the title since the title is always meant to be a bit small you can also add subtitle so subtitle can contain anything used to describe the title so I can write this is an animal and similarly I can add the subtitle in cat you see so the subtitle is now arriving here so here you can clearly see the difference between defining a normal text as well as defining a list inside a list style which structures your data for you so that on the left right you can add some icons or whatever you want as well as some mini description in the below by using subtitle. So apart from the list view, let's see how can we add padding or margin to a container. So define a container here and give its child as text cat. So for defining any margin or padding, use margin. You can do it using edge insights. Now it has three types, all, only or symmetric. So all is used whenever you want to give margin to all the four sides that is top, bottom, left and right. Only is used whenever you want to give margin to only one side and symmetric is of two types. So it is either horizontal or vertical. Horizontal is used whenever you want to give margin to the left and right side and vertical can be used whenever you want to give margin on the top and bottom. So let's use symmetric here. And give some horizontal margin as 30.0. Now it accepts double value. And give some color so that we can easily differentiate the margin. So on implementing this change. You can see that a green container has been created. And it is some distance between the screen of the emulator and the container. Well that distance is because of margin. So margin is the distance between the surrounding of the container and the container itself. So similarly you can also add a padding 
using edge insides it also has three types so let's give some padding in the top only and 20.0 So not adding the padding so after adding the padding so after this you can see that there is some space between the cat as well as the container so padding is basically the difference in the screen so after this you can see that there is some space between the cat and the container so padding is the difference between the content of the container and the outline of the container you can also add padding to anything else using the padding widget so padding widget works the same all you have to do is assign any child so say suppose I'm adding any text like dog and also assign a padding so use edge insights dot all so that you can add padding to all the sides and define any double value so after this you can see that uh, in the screen we have a dog which has some space and that is because of the padding given. So this is all about adding a list view as well as about padding and margin in a container. Thank you. Hello everyone. So in this video, we'll be talking about what are stateful and what are stateless widgets. See, we've already used stateless widgets where we used to have some container or some gradient that used to display some text. In this video, I'll be introducing what are stateful widgets. So state is an information that can change during the lifetime of the widget. So say, suppose there's a checkbox. So whenever you check that or tick that checkbox, you are expecting the checkbox to display a tick or to change some color or show any change so that can be done only when the state of that widget that is that checkbox has to be changed but in case of stateless widget it remains constant throughout the application and shows no change so in the previous application when we used the gradient and showed the text that this is the text we didn't want that text to be changed and we wanted the text to be displayed as it is throughout the application is running. So that is when we use stateless widget. Stateful widgets can be used whenever the UI or the data of the application changes dynamically. So say suppose you're entering a form and when you're using the keyboard to type some words, you're expecting that word to be displayed on your screen also. So that can only be done when you're using a stateful widget. So it keeps on changing its data or whatever it's showing as and when it feels that something is changing or something is being interacted by the user. Stateless widget can be used whenever static information is to be displayed to the user. So whenever you want to say suppose display the app bar. So the app bar has always the title or the name of the application and you want to display it as it is throughout the application. In that case stateless widgets are used. Some of the example of stateful widgets can be checkbox, radio button, or even the forms wherein we use various drop down or text fields or text areas, anything like that. In case of stateless widgets, they can be icon, text or container or something like that. Now, stateful widget use create state function and return a state. Whereas in stateless, we always to return a widget in the build function. So we always used to return some container or say suppose you can also return some row or column because they are all widgets. So we used to return them in the build function. But in the stateful widgets, you will be returning a state and that too in a create state function. Now stateful widgets use set state to inform the framework that the widget needs to be redrawn. So say suppose you have checked a radio button out of two or three. So whenever you press that radio button, you want the UI that is displayed on the screen to be changed and show whatever you have clicked. So that can be done using stateful widget and that can also be done using set state function. So what set state function does is basically it informs that information is being changed and it should be similarly reflected in the UI. So whenever there's a checkbox and you click on it, you want it to be checked like this and this can be done only using stateful widgets by applying set state so that 
uh, set state shows that you need to set the state of this widget to something else that is now be currently changed by the user whereas in stateless widget you don't need anything like that you just you need to define it once because already the state is not changing and you don't have to show it or show different data again and again with the same data throughout so we'll be learning how can we do this in code in the next videos thank you Hello everyone, so it's that time of the video where we explore the stateful widgets. So in this video we will be creating some forms and take different type of inputs from the user by using different form elements like drop down, checkbox or form field and then we will be saving it into our database. So let's get started. First of all your class will extend from a stateful widget and it will contain a function called create state which on the left and right hand side will take the name of the state that this second class has so then you'll have to create another class which will be the state itself and the state will be extended from the state of the class so every class is a state and so this state will be extended from the class itself then here yeah, let's see how can we create a form in flutter so we already have a widget known as form in flutter so inside the form i'll be defining a column and inside column i'll be defining the different different form elements so that they are displayed in a proper manner. So the first element is text form field. Text form field is used to take inputs from the user. So the user has to type out all the values in the text field that is given in the form. Now all it has is decoration. Now decoration has label text and hint text. So let's try to run this and see how the form is being displayed. The label text that was written enter name is being displayed here and as and when the user clicks this text form field, the name which was given as the hint text is being displayed. So the user is confirmed that whatever data he is typing is for the text, the given text field itself. So next up we have enter age. So in enter age you will see that as and when I click this, my keyboard changes. So Flutter allows you to customize your keyboard according to the input that you want from the user. So here I have written keyboard type as text input type dot number. So the keyboard can be customized in many ways. The first is date time so you can enter the date time. Email address so it adds at the rate and com to the keyboard. Multi line is when you want to write multiple data or a huge data like that of address so we can use multi line. Number is used to write numbers so 1, 2, 3, 4 whatever. Phone is, all, phone is used to add some hashtag or asterisk values. Text is used to write simple text. URL is used whenever you want to use www.com. So these values are added to your customized keyboard. So say suppose you run phone. So on running phone now, You'll see that the keyboard now has this plus sign and now also this hashtag and asterisk. So this is all because you've changed the keyboard type. Now the next thing is password. So you don't want your password to be visible to the user. So all we can do is write obscure text as true. So this will make sure that whatever data that you write here is going to be in the form of asterisk. So no one else other than the user knows that what data is being stored in the text form field. Also, in case you want the user to enter only limited amount of characters, all you can do is in the text form field, you can write maximum length and then define the length to be 20. So when you run this again, you will see that now the maximum limit is 20. So when you want to write anything like that, and if it exceeds the value of 20, C. So it's not going to, even if you go and typing, it's not going to display here because the maximum character length is 20. So this is all about text form field. Now next is drop down button. So here in the hint is the text that is displayed here. So the user knows that what is this drop down all about. Then the items are all stored in a list. So first of all, I've created a list which is known as locations. And it has some random values like A, B, C, D. Now, now this 
list is being mapped and it is creating a drop down menu item so each menu item has a child of text of location so location is the single value so we are iterating through every item of the list and currently location is the value out of all the locations so that location is the val uh, child and value is whenever I'm clicking this button so now it will not be working because as you can see there's a yellow underline and on seeing what the problem is see so the on change is required so on change we'll uh, write this later when we are validating and submitting our data so currently it will not work but value is whenever out of all the list of locations if i'm selecting a and i, va and I want that a should be taken to my database as well so value is the data that i want to be stored in my database in the back end so value is used then uh, we are using two list to convert all of this map into a list because you'll see that items it requires a list of drop down menu item so two list is used to convert all of that drop down into a list and then display it so next up we have our radio buttons so radio buttons are defined in a row so you'll notice that when you define your row inside a column it will display some error and that is because the configuration of elements of the row is not fixed and so we'll keep the radio buttons in expanded widget we have already started what expanded does it takes up all that space that's present inside the screen so herein we have two radio buttons one for single and one for married also you'll notice that a form has multiple type of radio buttons so say suppose we have one which is used to check if you are single or married and the other one is used to check if you are a single child or you have siblings so for that we don't want that radio buttons to get mixed up so each radio button has a group so here our group value is marital status marital status is already defined single as a, as a default then next up we have checkbox so checkbox is used to display so checkbox is used to display here if you want to be checked or not so the value is terms checked and since the value of checkbox can be either true or false the value is defined as a boolean here so terms checked is a boolean and it is labeled as true now you'll see that here in the checkbox is being displayed in the right hand side in case i want it to be in the leading position that is in the left what i'll do is in the control affinity you write leading so on implementing this you will see that now the checkbox is in the left hand side so you can similarly control the position of your checkbox by leading or trailing so by leading it will come in the left by trailing it will come in the right as it was before now title is used to display the text that this is the checkbox for and in case you want to check it you can do otherwise don't check it now also the value is displayed in the boolean next up we have a raise button so till now we have already worked with gesture detectors so now in case i only want to display a simple button i can use an inbuilt function in flutter that is raised button first of all i'm defining the color of the button which is not yet displayed because as earlier stated on change or on submitted is not present and we'll be working on that later so by color i'm defining the color of the button then second i'm defining the color of the text that has to be present inside the button and then we have the child which says register so register is being displayed here also you'll notice that in case your screen is small on clicking any text form field if a pop-up appears there will be an overflow to overcome this all you can do is wrap up all your form inside a single child scroll view so we already know that single child scroll view defines that the form is a single child and the user can scroll through this form and to make it more clear i've also defined some margin in the horizontal side so horizontal means left and right side so there's a margin of 10.0 so it looks more appropriate so in this video we learned about various form elements like text form field drop down radio button checkbox as well as button in the next video we'll learn how to validate all this data and then save it to our server thank you Hello everyone, so in this video we will see how can we validate the data that is being entered by the user in our form. So first of all why is validation important? So say suppose you are an application, inside the enter age 
you forgot to customize your keyboard and now the user can enter any alphabet as well as numeric value or special symbols. And this is exactly what we don't want. So the app should display some sort of error or warning that the data which is entered by the user is wrong. So therefore validation is important to make sure that we keep a check on the data that is entered by the user. So let's see how can we do this. So to uniquely identify any form, all we have to do is define a key. Now what key does is basically it uniquely identifies your form. So whenever you want to validate your form or save the data that's being entered by the user, the key plays an important role by identifying your form and then performing the further actions. So key will be defined as a final and then equal to global key as form state. So this is all so that you can uniquely identify a form. Now let's see how can we work on different form elements. So the first is text form field. So it has a validator function. The value is whenever your user is entering any information. So whatever change is being experienced by the text form field is saved in the form of value. So you have to check that if that value is empty, then you'll be returning please enter a name. Similar goes with the age. So whenever you're checking that if the value is empty of age, then you have to return enter age. So right now it's not working, but it will start working once we save all the data also. So you'll see that whenever I click register without entering any form of data in any three of the fields, it will display error. So in this, it will display please enter a name and in the second one, it will display enter age. Now this was all about checking if the data is empty or not. In case of password, I also want to check if the length is less than 8 or not. So all I can do is, I can also add another validator which is value.length. So value.length keeps a check on the length of the data that is entered by the user. If the value is less than 8, then you should return that password should be more than 8 characters. So in case of password you are checking, first of all, it's empty or not and second, if the length is less than 8 or not. So this is all about text form field. Let's go to drop down button. So in drop down button, all we are doing is displaying a list of options for the user to choose from. So since the list of the drop down items is made by us, we can be assured that all the data is valid. So let's move on to the radio button now. For the radio buttons, using the group value, we have already assigned the default value and that is single. So the marital status is single right now. So in case the user opens this application, all we want from the radio button is that at least single or married should be selected. And we have already assigned the default value to be single. So even if the user doesn't choose any value, we have a default value. And in case he wants to change this single to married, he can always click on the radio button and change it. So we don't need any type of validator in case of radio buttons. Similarly in checkbox, because in case we want that uh, the checkbox should be checked all the time and it should be compulsory then we can state that in our functions but right now all we can do is basically define a default value so here the default value terms checked is termed as true so therefore on opening the application it is checked right now but in case the user changes it and I don't want it to be compulsory it is completely okay and therefore we don't want any validator here also so in the whole form, all we need validator is for text form fields. Also you can check various uh, emails like it has add the rate and it has dot or not and what all the values you want on the left and right side of the add the rate or dot. So similar validations can be used and they can be defined in the validator of text form field. So this is all about validation. In the next video, we'll see how can we save the data that is already taken in these fields. Thank you. Hello everyone. So in this video, we'll be seeing how can we save the different form of data that we are taking from the user in the form. So first of all, we'll be defining different different variables so that whenever the data is being entered by the user, that is saved in these variables and then passed on to the backend. So we have already defined name, age of zero, password. The matter status and terms check were already defined earlier. The locations were also defined earlier for the drop down button. 
So first of all, moving on to the text form field, we have on save function, and here value is same, so that whenever the user is typing anything and then he presses a button or on any action, that value of the text form field gets here, and then what set state does is basically change the value of the variable at that particular moment of time. So say suppose in an application in the radio fields, you have select married. So as in when you have select married. You want the app to display the change at that particular time, and this is when stateful widget and set state comes into play. So whenever you're clicking anything or changing anything, set state will change the value of that variable at that point itself, so that user can see the change. So on save, I'm setting the state of the name variable as the value which is being entered by the user. Similar goes with password as well as the age. Now all I have to understand is basically. That age is a numeric value, and text form field returns a string value. So I'll be trying to convert the value into an integer and then pass it to a age variable. Then on drop down button, I have on change function. Similarly, I'll use set state to change the location of the variable. I also in drop down, I'll be setting the state of marital status to the value that is then pressed by the user. And similar goes with check box type. So here also I'll be using on change inside that i'll be writing set state function to change the value of terms check and then in the last i'll write a function in the raise button which is known as on press submit so what i'll do is in this function first of all i check if the form is validated or not and this is when our key comes into play so if the value of key is validated then you have to save the value of the key and then print all the values here you can also display the value or display some message to the user that the data is being saved so let's try to run all of this so in case i don't enter any data here and click on register you can see that there are red color text present here and this is all that we have written already in the validator so here we have written enter age and please enter a name and that is being displayed here so in case i write the values here And let's write a small password and see if it works. So still, you will see that enter name and enter age are all fine, but there is still red present in the password because the length is smaller, and it's showing password should be more than eight characters. So I'll be adding something more here. Select something from the drop down, and I don't want to change any value of the radio button or checkbox, and simply. Click register. So now everything is done, and the output can be seen here in the book console. So here, all the data that was entered here is being displayed. Similarly, you can display this data to the user. So in this video, we learnt about what is a form, what are the different form elements that can be defined, how can we validate the data that is being entered by the user, and also save the data to our backend. Thank you. Hello everyone. In the previous videos, we have seen how can we add certain widgets like container, rows, columns, icons, or even text to our page. Now, in this video, we'll be seeing how can we create certain other pages like them and also navigate between the two. I'm sure you've never seen an app with only a single page in it. Therefore, navigation plays a very important role in connecting the different pages of an application. So for that you have to understand some basic concepts. Say suppose there is no application open right now. So what Flutter does is basically it stores all the screens of an application in the form of a stack. Now stack follows last in and first out, which means the last thing that was pushed inside is the first thing to go out when we do pop operation. So now say suppose you open an application and the first screen opens. So the stack will now be pushed with a screen one inside it. So now the top of the stack has screen one. Similarly, when you move to another page of that application, say suppose screen two. Now screen two will be pushed inside the stack, and the top of the stack is now screen two. Similarly, if the user presses the back button here, the screen two will get popped out, and now the stack will only have screen one, and it will display this screen. 
and when the user again presses this back button, the application will then close and the stack will become empty once again. Now let's try to do all of this by using some code and data. So for going to one page to another, so for going from one page to another, all you have to do is create something called routes in the main dot dart. So what route does is basically it contains a map of string and widget builder. String is the name of the screen that you want to give on the left hand side and widget builder returns this different screens of an application. Right now I only have one class which is second class and that is why I have defined it everywhere. But in case you have more than one pages, you can always add different names and remove the rest of the replications to remove any confusions later. So once you have named your routes in the route section in main.dart, all you have to do is use gesture detectors and inside gesture detectors you can write some code for pushing and popping those screens. Now moving back, in case you want to go from one screen to another, you can use a simple basic push operation. So it has two types of inputs. Say suppose you have written all of that in the routes, you can use push named function and write the name of the route that you want to get pushed. Otherwise, in case you want to add some parameters in your screen, you can also use material page route and return the builder of the screen using navigators or push. Both of them will perform the same function. What they will do is in case you have an app with screen 1, 2 and 3 open correctly and you do push operation of screen 4, the stack will get full with screen 4 and popping the screen 4 will get closed and not screen 3. So this was one of those operations. We will be learning more of those operations in the later videos. Thank you. Hello everyone, so in this video I will be talking about a very important function that is useful for navigation. So the name of function is pop, let's see how we can code that. All you have to write is navigator.offcontext.pop. So as we all know that all the screens of an application are stored in a form of stack. So say suppose a user has opened an application and then opens screen 1, 2, 3 and in the last screen 4 and then he's press the back button of your phone. So the pop function will get initiated and the screen 4 will get popped out of the stack. So now screen 3 will be visible to the user and he will be working on screen 3. So let's try to code all of that. So here create another dart file in your lib. I will name it as second underscore screen dot dart. Paste all the code that is already present in first screen and remove the content so that it can be differentiated. I will write a text which says screen 2. Also in the first screen, all I want is that on a click of a button or a text, it should navigate or push to second screen. So what I will do is inside the column, I will define a gesture detector and the child should be a text which says click me and on tap I'll create a function which navigates so I'll write navigator dot off context dot push name now the name of the screen is not yet defined in the main dot dart so I'll do it at first remove all the extra names and also make sure that the name of your class is different so I'll write it as second page class because every dart file should have a unique class name so I will write it as second page class so all of this is already defined in the routes now in the first screen I'll give my route name and the route name is screen 2 also make sure that when you are using routes your home should have only the class that you want to call as soon as the application is open. So I'll remove all of this and write second class 
because it is my first paint and also you have to paste all of that scaffold thing in your dart file so whenever you are working with more than one page you should make sure that each page or each dart file has its own scaffold because scaffold has a unique type of app bar or navigation drawer and in case you want it to be different for different pages you have to define scaffold for each page and don't forget to close the braces similarly in second screen i'll be defining another scaffold and give the title as screen 2 perfect so everything is done now let's try and run all of this running this you will see that we have a click me at the bottom of the three rows that we have created earlier so on clicking click me i have a screen to open in the next page perfect you will also see in the top left corner there's an arrow button on the click of which we come back to the first screen so in case you don't want it to appear it like that all you can do is an app bar there's something called automatically implying leading so what it does is basically if you are move, using navigation to move from one screen to another and you don't want a user to show that this screen has been pushed then you can always tell the automatically implying leading as false so see now after doing this the arrow is not here on the top left but i'll suggest that in case you are pushing it you should always try and keep the keep it as true that the user has some idea that he is navigating through different screens otherwise he will think that he is on the same screen every time he is doing something also i want that on screen 2 it should display something like click me so that whenever i press click me it should pop back to the first screen so what i'll do is in the child i'll define a column and the column has children So the first child will be a text, and the second will be a gesture detector. And the gesture detector will be a child of text, which says, "Take me back." And on tap, I define a function, which says. navigator dot off context dot pop so after writing this let's see what is the difference okay so on clicking me i go to the next screen and there's something else called take me back and when i click on take me back i'm taken to the first screen itself so this is how we use push and pop also you can see that when you press the back button here we don't want the app to close like it is doing right now see so the app closes on clicking the back button of the phone app but we want to make sure that the user is completely sure that he is pressing the back button and you want to show him say suppose some text that this is the final screen and after pressing back we will be closing the app so what we can do is inside the material I define another widget which is called will pop scope, and it has a child of our column that was defined earlier. Close the braces. So what will pop scope does is basically it will question the user that this is the last screen. Do you want to quit the application? So if except child, it is also had on will pop, which accepts a future boolean function. So I add a function here. Let's write some code so that whenever the user is on the last screen and presses the back button, some dialog box will appear. So write show dialog. Give the context as context, which is already defined in the build function of your class. And you can define the child, but it is deprecated now, which means that it is not used. So use builder. Use fat expressions and write some alert dialog. And give the title as some text widget which says, "Are you sure?" And 
then in the content give another text which says it will close the application and don't forget to close your function using the semicolon so on implementing this you will see that whenever i click the back button a raw dialog box is shown so this is the title and this is the content that we wrote so in this video we learned about push and pop function and how we can maintain routes in the main dot dart and also about the will pop scope function thank you hello everyone so in the previous video we have discussed about push and pop function now in this video we will be talking about some more functions that can be used in navigation so they are push replacement named function and pop and push named function now both of them perform almost the same function what they do is say suppose in a stack you have three screens and you want to replace the top of the stack with some other screen this functions can be used so let's look at the code first so in case of the first one all you have to do is write navigator dot off context the name of the function and then inside the bracket write the name of the screen that you have already defined in the routes of main dot dot similarly for the second one use navigator and then the function name and inside the bracket the name of the screen so what these two will do that in case you have three screens screen 1 2 and 3 and use these function the screen 3 will get replaced by screen 4 now when can we use this so say suppose you have a login page wherein the user enters his or her credentials and after pressing on the login button it goes to another page say the dashboard page so when the user presses back button on dashboard page you do not want the user to come back to the credentials page or the login page so push replacement name function can be used because first of all it will replace the login page with the dashboard page also it gives a type of entry animation so it will look like you want the user to enter the application now second scenario say suppose you have an application where a page shows a list of all the items that are present in your cart you go to another page say apply filters therein you select all the filters that you want to apply on the cart and select apply filters button it pops out that screen and takes you back to the screen where it shows a list of all the items in your cart but with the filters on it now in this case also the filter screen is popped so pop and push name can be used here also because it provides a type of exit animation so in short both of these function provide the same functionality of replacing one screen with another but the first function provides a type of entry animation and the second function provides a type of exit animation you will understand when you implement it on your own so this is all about this video thank you hello everyone so in this video i'll be introducing another function that can be used for navigation in flutter so the name of function is pop until as the name itself suggests pop until will keep on popping all the screens which are present in a stack until it reaches the particular screen that i have already defined in the function so let's start with the code itself all you have to type is navigator dot pop until and write the name of the screen that you have already defined in the routes of main dot dart and also you will be writing all of this code in a gesture detector so that whenever the user presses the gesture detector the pop until function will come into action so say for an example in an app you have screen 1 2 and 3 and the user is currently on screen 3 and you apply pop until screen 1 so screen 3 and screen 2 will pop out and the user will be taken to the screen 1 now when can this be used so say suppose you have created an application which has certain pages say suppose 2 to 3 pages to enter the information of the user that is using the application uh, so the user diligently enters the information in screen 1 as well as screen 2 
but in screen 3 they decide not to submit this data to the user or to the application and presses cancel button. So now what pop until function will do it will take the user back to the initial screen without saving any data that was entered in between these screens. So this is about this function. We will learn about some more functions in the next videos. Thank you. Hello everyone. So in this video, let's explore some more functions that can be used for navigation in Flutter. So the name of function is push named and remove until. Let's see how can we code this. You have to write navigator.off context dot push name and remove until and inside the brackets the name of the screen that you want to push in this case it is screen 4 and then write route dynamic route which implies false. Now this means that in case you have multiple screens in your stack already present this function will make sure that all of that is popped out and then screen 4 is pushed. So say for example you have screen 1, 2 and 3 in your stack and you apply this function then route dynamic false will pop screen 3, 2 and 1 out of the stack and then push screen 4. Now when can this be used? So say suppose a user has opened your application, gone through the dashboard page and the multiple screens entered his or her data and explored every page of the application and then go to the logout page and pressed logged out. Now in that case when the user is logged out we don't want the user to go to the previous page or the dashboard page when they press the back button of your phone. So we can use this function to make sure that only the logout page is pressed or is pushed to the screen and all the rest of the pages or the routes are popped out. And you can use this function and write route dynamic route false so that all the dashboard pages and the previous pages are popped out. Now there's another way to write this function. So now in case you don't want all the screens to get popped out, you can write module route dot width name and inside that the name of the screen until which you want all the screens to get popped out. So in case you have screen 1, 2 and 3 and you use this function to push screen 4 and pop out all the screens until 1, the screen 3 and screen 2 will get popped out of the stack and now screen 4 will be visible to the user. Now when can this be used? So say suppose you have a payment gateway in your application and the user makes some payment. So all you want to display him is a screen which says the payment is now complete. We can save that screen to be screen 4. Now you don't want the user to go back to making payments again when they are pressing the back button of their phone. So we can pop out all of that payment gateway and make them as screen 3 and screen 2. And screen 4 is basically the page which shows that the payment is now complete. And screen 1 can be any dashboard page which is not related to the payment. So this will not disrupt any flow of the application. So this was all about navigation in Flutter. Thank you. Hi, in this video, we will be learning how to pass JSON in Flutter. It's a pretty important topic because when we communicate with backend, the client sends the request to a server in a JSON format and similarly, server sends requests response to a client in a JSON format. So we pass the JSON and show the result which we got from client into a widgets. So I will be helping you with this. Nevertheless, knowing the basics of JSON passing in Flutter is pretty important. When you are good at this or if you need to work with a larger project, consider code generator libraries like JSON serializer etc. And I will be making videos on this after finishing this topic. So we will begin with simple structure first. So as we can see, the JSON the JSONs basically have curly braces in the starting and the endings and it has the key value pairs. So the, for the first one, the ID is the key and 120 is the value of it. Similarly, the name is the key and the Pratik Mevara is the value of it and score is the key and 98 is the value of it. So first we will be passing this, the simple JSON, then we will move on with the complex JSON and the arrays. So let's move on with this. 
first of all i have created a just a project so in this video will we will not be communicating or showing it the results in the widget we will just making the classes and after we know how to pass the json then we will make one application as a small project so i am making a directory with the name of models and in this first file we can have simple json dot so as we know so our json looks like ib colon 23 name so id is key and value is 123 as i told you before so this is a json which we get as a result from backend and we will be passing it so i am writing this in front of us so that it's easier for us to see like what's the result and we should not shuffle between the screens so it'll be easier for me to explain yeah so first what we should do we need to understand the structure of json json consists of map that has key value pairs or a list of maps so as we can see this is just a map it doesn't have a list so let's first we will make a json as we know this is like basically a detail of an student so we will pass the json so we will create a class class with the name of student and you know there are three three values basically id name and a score so we will give the names to it the string so we are creating variables first id string name name string int score yeah as 98 is not in the colon so basically it's int so we'll be writing int score go and we are, we will be creating constructor of this constructor are basically required when we call we need to call this class into a widget or we need, when we need to show results in the widget we call as a constructor so that we get the values over there so this dot id colon this dot in this dot score so this is the basic class what we have but right now we are not yet finished we need to pass the json still so for that we need to create a factory method according to dart documentation we use the factory keyword when implementing a constructor that doesn't always create a new instance of its class and that's why we need that's why we need it right now so factory we will be creating a factory constructor over here factory student dot from json map string dynamic json return student id json name json name score json score so as i told you factory method when we use it why we use it so basically factory keyword 
when implementing a constructor that does not always create a new instance of the class. So basically when we call this function, it doesn't create a new instance each and every time when we call this. It basically reuses the code every time. So it does not occupy space. So basically we will be using factory over here. Factory is the keyword. Then student dot from JSON. Student is the class name and from JSON is a function name basically which we are creating right now. And we are passing map string dynamic. So you will be having question why we are passing string dynamic value over here. So basically the, the JSON which we have as we can see it's a key value pair. It's like string 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 right now we have value id is also string and 120 is also string. So right now what JSON we have is in string string format but still we are passing string dynamic format because sometimes the JSON can be complex. The value, the key of the JSON is always a string, but the value can be of the maybe nested, may have a multiple JSONs or maybe an array inside that. So we're making string dynamic JSON right over here. So what we are doing over here, basically we are serializing, we are deserializing it over here. So yeah, you may be thinking like what is serialization and what is deserialization. So let me explain it to you once. Yeah. Serialization simply means writing the data as a string. So and deserializing is the opposite of that. It takes the raw data and reconstruct the object model. So what serialization is basically it's done when we send our data, like when we give request from client side to server side, we use serialization when we need to send a class or class or array of objects. So we create, we do serialization. We take the data as a string. So we simply means writing the data as a string. So that is serialization. That's what we do when we request to a server. When we get response from a server, it, it comes as a string. So it's just the opposite of that. Just what means the deserialization. It takes the raw data. It's basically a JSON. Is, mentioned, is the raw data over here and reconstruct the object model and that's what we did over there with the student class that's what we have created the student class okay so with this we are done with the like basic structure right now from next video we'll be making the video on the array so thank you Hi everyone, in this video, we will be passing JSON containing arrays. Now we conquer a JSON structure that is similar to the one which we have done. But instead of just single value, it might also have an array of values. As we can see in this JSON, a class is a similar, class is a similar key value pair as what we had done before. But the subject has an array of values which contains physics, chemistry, maths, which are values. It has a multiple values. That's why it's contained in a list or array. So for this, we'll be making a class. So let's code. Yeah. So I have already written, I have already created an array JSON dot dot and I have already written a JSON over here so that it's easier for us to see and code. Yeah. In this, we have class entity that has a simple string value, but the subject what we have, it has a value of list of string data type. So basically what we check once the structure of the JSON, the structure of JSON is the map basically because since it starts with a curly braces and ends with a curly braces. So it's a map. It's not list of map. It does contain a value. It does contain a value which has a list of string data type, but it's just a map. So we'll write a class similar to what we have written before, like class, maybe student again, student, then string, class, string, class. Oof. 
a uh, class is a keyword so we can use standard maybe then list of string basically since the values physics chemistry maths a string and is contained in a list so we have a list with a string data type and we give value of it this is subjects you can give any names but i prefer giving the same similar names to what the json key has name yeah now we will create similar constructor as these are the same step what we what we have done in the previous video so i am not explaining much and focusing on coding start subject uh, similarly we will create a factory use a factory keyword and create a function from this on student class name dot from json map string comma dynamic json like in this json you might be clear like why we are using string dynamic data type over here like this every time it's not we can't say we will have a string string value as we can see the subjects the entity the subject has a value of list data type list string data type so we keep it as a dynamic whatever it comes the value whatever it is we will map it with the key okay so the the student dot from json basically what it does it will return full object it will map everything and return the value it will return it returns the model over here. student so student are we standard json class whatever value you, whatever name you give for your whatever name you give for your consideration as i have written standard over here sorry spelling mistake standard as i have written standard over here but when i am mapping it with the json i need to use the key name what it is like class class is the key i have written the the string the name of the in the name in the model is standard but i need to use the well, key what i have what i am getting from the basically what i am getting key from the server so class is the key what server is giving it to me and i have written i will be storing that class value into a variable name standard so i am mapping standard with the i am mapping standard with the class basically that's what i have done over here then subjects is on subjects do you think like we are done with this but we are not so what the code which we have written it works for the simple json right now we have a list of string data type so basically when we run this code we'll get an error let me show the error what we get when we run so if we run that code we'll get the type list dynamic is not a subtype for type list string this is error which we will get so what does it means basically we are expecting a list string but we get a list dynamic since the application cannot identify the type yet so basically the flutter uh, the framework doesn't identify like what type of value is coming so it was expecting list string but it got a value as list dynamic so that's what we need to handle over here right now so in this what we'll do like these type of errors like i have faced in lot of time when i was doing my development so it's pretty easy to handle once you get a hook of it it's like pretty simple like you can create a variable name var i'm not giving any data type over here so we are using var over here um, standard basically standard no subjects subjects from json 
is equals to json subjects here first we are mapping a variable subjects from json to the subjects subjects entity but subject from json is still a list dynamic now we explicitly create a list of string so right now we have just mapped the value of the value of json of subjects to a subjects from json now we will create a specific list string value list string string value subjects list list it will point to create new object list string dot from and we will write right now what subjects from json subjects from json yeah with this what we have done right now first we are mapping our variable subjects from json to the json string subject entity but still the value of subjects from json is in list dynamic format so then we create a explicitly list string type the list string we have given the variable name subject list that contains the element of the string from json so what we have done we have mapped values of subjects from json which was in a list dynamic format to a list string using from keyword this is what from keyword does it will take the values from subjects from json and store it in list of string as a array and now we will change over here list of string it will be subjects subjects list perfect now if we will run it won't give you any error it will return so basically when we pass the value from student dot from json the we will pass the raw json we will get the model of the class okay with this this law we get to know like how we can pass array of strings in the json format Hi, in this video, we will be learning how to pass JSON which has nested structures. So, this is the JSON which we will be working on this time. Shape name is the similar to what we have we had key value pair in the previous videos. This time, the property is the key, which is value of which has the value of an object instead of having a basic data type. So when we work with such problems, we break down the things, then we code. So what we will be doing, we will be creating first the class with the name of property. Then we create an outer class with the name of shape. Then we call the inside class to the outer class. Basically we will be creating, we will be calling property class to the shape class. Let's code, you will get to know how, what I'm speaking about. It's better to code and then understand. So I have already created nested json dot dot over here. And, and written the JSON which we require and it's easier for us to understand what I have been doing from the previous videos also. So I have created class with the name of shape. No, first we will create the inner class. Class with the name of property. So it's just my habit. This is how I work. I create the inner class first and I move outside. So that's what I do. It's to you how you code. Everyone have a different coding style methodology double breadth now creating a constructor of it this dot this dot but we will not write the factory function over here right now First we will create a class of the outer outer class also outer class with the name of shape and the string shape name and how we will call the inner class that's what i was speaking of we will call the inner class over here property we can't use any other data type over here because 
what we were getting from the server is an object so what we are doing we are calling just the inner class we are we have created a class and we are calling that into another class and we will create object over here constructor over here sorry the start property comma this dot shape name yeah and now we will write the factory function for both of the code So what we do when we create the similar thing which I follow, I make the factory function for the inner classes first, then I move outside. Similarly, I will make the factory function for the property first, then I will make it for the the shape from JSON map string. Dynamic name JSON and return the will return class model over here property and path JSON and key name is path and similarly width. This on and similarly we will create a factory class for the outer class factory shape from JSON map string. Dynamic JSON return shape property JSON property shape name. JSON. As I told, key name should be the same what we are getting from the server. So I have not written the underscore over here, but I need to write it over here since I am getting the key as shape underscore name from the server. Yeah, this is what we have written right now. Do you think it is correct? Do you think like we are done with this right now? No. We are not because when we are passing the from JSON the value the raw JSON from shape dot from JSON, we have not called the property class over here. So what we will do the JSON property I need to call the from JSON of the property function over here. I will call property dot from JSON and JSON. Yeah. This will work perfectly. The previous code what we have written will get an error. Let me show you the error what we will be getting. Error will be type internal linked hash map string dynamic is not a subtype of type property. It will show the type. It, this is basically a type mismatch error. Yeah. So, so this is how it will work. You, we need to call the property dot from JSON of the inner class over here. So that's what I have told you the what I, how I follow the things. First, I create the class or first I create the inner class, the inner most nested class. Then I start making outer classes and I first initializes the variables and their constructors. Then I write the factory of each classes from as moving from bottom to top. How we made the classes? First, we made the property, then shape. First, we made the first we made the class property. Initialize the then variables name width and prop breadth and the constructor then i made class shape initialize the name shape name initialize property and created a constructor then i started making the factory and i created the factory first for the innermost class the property then i made it for shape because i have to call the property class 
that is why okay with this now we know how to pass the nested json thank you hi this is last section of flutter series where we will be learning how to how to do http request get the data and show it in an application so in this we'll be making a earthquake application where we'll be using a api free api of us government so over here i have already built a simple ui so that we don't waste time building a ui and i will add the link of this repository in the resources so that you can clone and work on it directly and it's pretty simple i will explain you the code what i have done in this i have the scaffold in the background color which is gray i have used because i have made a con containers white then in that i have a center tile the app bar title i have made it center tile true then elevation over here is zero and the text of the title i have written over here then in container i have a list view builder where i have a container and each container i have done a box decoration and given a shadow i made it blur and box shape i made it rectangle and the color i have given is white it's pretty off white it's not actually white then border radius is 10 and margin and padding i have used is 8 then i used a row so basically this is a row where i have made one container which uses a width of one sixth of the phone size one sixth of the phone size what are the width is using media query then i have made a sh like circular shape with a red color and that i have write the one right now it's one uh, will be basically it will be having the magnitude of earthquake then the, another container which is in that contains column which has the main city name and then the local light that's what that's all and this is all in list view builder so it's scrollable which is scrollable and I have already made a weather API class which will be using the API which we will be using so I have already made it you can also use this API let me show you so API is earthquake API you can directly search earthquake API and API documentation earthquake catalog so we will be using this link get query yeah this one so you can also get this link from the website itself it's pretty easy and it's very complex json so i have already built it pre-built it so if we don't waste time doing this thank you from the next sessions and next video onwards we'll be doing the future builder then the http request with that we'll be completing our the flutter series thank you Hi, in this video, we will be seeing how to use Future Builder in an application. So, why do we need Future Builder? Basically, we need Future Builder because we don't know what data we will be having in the future. So, we just use the Future Builder as a function, Future Builder, to call the function which will return us the future value for the time we will just use the variables and the data will be filled, filled later on. And if suppose some error occur, it will return us a snapshot with an error. So we can check and we can give an error to our screen. So widget future builder is a widget that builds itself based on the latest snapshot. Snapshot is basically what the function will return of interaction with the future. Future is the function which we will be calling. So future is the function which we will be calling and which will return the snapshot. Which will return the snapshot. So let's begin with coding the hands-on like how to integrate future builder in an application so basically what we will do we need to you we need to show when we have when we request to a server and we get the perfect 200 uh, response code then we need to show the list view builder this few screen this screen we should show and otherwise we will be showing there is a server error and server under maintenance so for this we will use future builder over here future builder dot future builder then we call it over here we'll be calling a future 
as I said, future is future will is the function. So this is a function future will be calling. So let's create a function fetch post. Fetch post. And let's create function of her. Fetch so it's a async function we want this into working asynchronous fetch post sorry 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 over there the parenthesis will be on this side I made a mistake async correct now we have got the future over here let's cut this first or maybe we can comment it and we will uncomment it afterwards so let's comment it first and this is where our row is ending till here we were returning this few will yeah till here we need to comment commented the perfect comment the future builder this is like future is the function which will calling and will get a snapshot from over here so what we'll do we'll use builder over here so we have used future now we'll use builder builder will be used to build the ui which we need to show so we'll do builder uh, build context so just to pass the context and then async snapshot snapshot yeah. then snapshot snapshot is basically what our function will return if it shows it's a successful result we will show the ui otherwise it will show like server and maintenance and we don't have we, they, we, we have three cases suppose we don't have any result yet later in the case when the app is just opened and there is no data inside it then what it should show that will first so we'll check if snapshot equals snapshot dot data is equals to equals to null then it should show a circular bar circular progress bar so container so what I will do, I will make a container and I will center the circular container, child center, child center and then child circular progress bar, circular, sorry, 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 circular, progress indicator perfect and then yeah so this is one of the case when we don't have any data on our screen so we should show the circular circular data when it's none then we show the circular progress indicator then we check else if else if snapshot data is not equal to none and there's one more condition when snapshot data is not equal to null means something we have something which we have got from the function is not equals to null and here we will show then we'll check if we are we will returning from the sorry i have placed it in the wrong place control x so snapshot.data is not equal to null. When it's not equal to null, I will check the snapshot.data is snapshot.data is equal to is equal to sorry for inconvenience inconvenience I hope can Convenience, ENT, for inconvenience, server, 
under maintenance server under maintenance if the function is written in this then we have to show then we have to return container with child center and then we need to show the what we are returning child text and what we have returned the snapshot of data sorry snapshot dot data and now we yep. and if this is not means we have successfully got the result and we will show the ui so over here we will return our list view builder what we supposed to what we have to show when the result is successful so i will just cut this and paste it over there Yep, I have to make this and remove. I feel it's pretty working right now. So what's happening? Sorry for inconvenience. So what I have done, I used a future builder and future in future I'm calling a fetch post function which will return what I'm getting from an one what I'm getting when we I am request doing HTTP request. If this data is null, then we need to know server progress bar. This will be a condition when the user just opens an app. Then, if we then and if the snapshot of data is not equal to null, we'll check if I am sending from the function sorry for inconvenience server under maintenance. Then I need to show the text in between in the center is that. Otherwise, this is not a condition. Means we have successfully called the result. And then I will show the list view dot build over here. This is how it will work. Let's try and execute it. Right now we haven't defined the fetch post function, but still it will sh it will give some result. It will show us the circular progress indicator over here. And I will be putting this code on the GitHub, the initial commit, which you can just clone it and start working on the future builder directly itself. So it will be easier for you. Rather than making the copying the whole UI again, be easier for you to build. And I haven't explained in the weather API dot dart class because in just previous three videos, like we uh, we have done this part only, so you can directly go through this. It's pretty easy. Like there's much nothing much. Like I've already explained like how the things are working, how we call the classes, how we make the list of class. So everything is pretty similar. So I didn't explain much. And mean dot dot is same. This is I already explained to you like how the dot is, how I designed everything. So let's wait for it to execute and show up on the screen. The next video we'll be making the fetch post function then we'll be having a full data so yeah as we can see like we haven't defined the fetch post function so it's not returning anything so for time being the snapshot is null that's why we can just see the circular progress bar in the next video will be i will be making a fetch post function where i will teach you how to make a http request thank you Hi, in this video, we'll be seeing how to make a HTTP request. For that, we need to add a package in the first pack YAML of HTTP. This is how in dev dependency, I have added HTTP colon. There's no need to write version if you want, you can write it. If you don't want, you may not write it. It will still work. It will take a compatible, a compatible version or the latest version from the repository for you. So now what we'll do. We will first make a file that's global dot dot. It's a good habit of making a separate file just just to save all the URLs that are being used in your application. So 
so cons base underscore url is equals to this then constant and earth quick underscore url is equals to this so as i said we'll be using us this documentation so let's open this and copy the base url so we'll be using this query open this this is a full what you have so this will be our base url control c and sorry control c and the base url here then we have a quick full url control c here Scope CRL slash this. So this is a full URL. So it's good, always a good habit to make a separate file where we store all the all the URLs what we are having if something changes so that we can change it easily. So that's why I have made a separate file for the global dot dot. Now I will make a fetch post function as I discussed similarly as we have discussed in the previous video we are not getting any we are not getting any data over here right now so we are just seeing the self for the progress bar so for this first we need to import import http dot cool then we need to import global dot dot so what we have made uh, the, module slash global dot dot then the weather API class what we have made import module dot weather api dot dot then we need to use async we need to import the async class import async then we need to use import convert class that converts the json it's basically a converter the data which is sent is in a certain format encode it which will decode it so that we can convert it into class and use it in our application so this is a patch for function which we need to build right now so i'll show you what we have to write code for this and let's do it so what are you doing the var response response is basically what we'll be getting from the from the request and await await is used basically it will wait for the response to come then it will execute the next statement in this function async await works in this fashion http sorry http dot get so as we have seen in this website this is a get request this is a get request which we are using oh yeah it's get request so we need to use get and so what I will do over here, HTTP S H, I will make it HTTP, HTTP. So now I can use HTTP over here, HTTP dot get, and now we'll use the URL, what we earthquake URL, earthquake URL, the get request, and the header, I will set the content type, what type of content I will be what type of content I mix content type is application JSON application slash JSON and 
that's it this is a request what we have need as soon as we get any response we will check if response dot code response sorry status code dot status code is equal to equals to 200 200 is basically success like we have got a perfect result what we wanted so we'll print so i will first print the body response body and uh, response dot sorry response one typos this time body yeah so i printed the response body and else I print error. So let's run this and we'll get to see like how it's happening. Then we'll encode and decode. We'll code further. So let's see. Let's why? Defined. Okay, wait. It's not saved. Yeah, like as we can see, as I have just printed the whole response dot body, I'm getting the full response over here. This is the response what we wanted. So as we are getting successful response, we need to show it in an application. So what we'll do over here? So finally, I'll use the weather app weather api uh, weather api let's name it weather api that's it now this is the class we have created object of it now we will use it so what i'm doing over here response body we have printed so we'll do final data is equals to json dot decode so converter class is used for this because we want to decode everything json dot decode and we'll put data inside that no we'll do response body inside that sorry response my bad response body dot body perfect so why we use convert we have imported the converter over here so why we imported this because we need to it's used for encoding and decoding it will basically convert json into classes into this area it will decode the whole json and we have saved that into variable called data so now we need to assign it to our weather weather api variable which is equals to weather api dot from json that you made from json and to json are two part of it so we have made it from json and then we'll return weather api yeah this function is pretty easy like what we did we just made a http request when we get the request we check what is status code if it's 200 i printed the response body and this is like how it's getting printed now we can see we are getting successful requests so what i did i just first decoded the whole json then uh, saved into a variable called data. Then using weather API, I have converted the JSON, full JSON into a class, and I'm returning that object, the class object, that's what I'm returning over here. And we will be using this object to show data in an application. So let's run it and see what happens. As you can see right now, we are showing the default default what I have printed over there but it's we are now right now we are returning it's successful it's returning something so this time it's the snapshot the data is not equal to null and neither it's all for inconvenience server and maintenance so it's returning perfectly so what I will doing so in error I will return this sorry for convenience sorry for inconvenience server under maintenance so if some error occur We'll get this result and we can show this this will work perfectly fine so what we have to do now so what we have like what we converted and saved into our 
class object with whether API name we need to use that and show the data into application so what I will do over here so this is one I will remove this this time so basically the magnitude can be decimal too but I feel we just need to show the magnitude in uh, integer format because it would look good in an application so what I will be doing I will converting into an integer whether API dot feature and index start properties dot magnitude mag and I will use seal over here dot seal so that I get an integer dot to string perfect it will print let's try this and first over here I need to add item counter item counter is basically how much data I have in it and how much data I have, how many times I want to loop this whether API dot features dot length so I feel this should work now so as you can see as soon as I ran I am getting the data like what I wanted to show I am getting all data so now one more thing uh, as you can see I will show you the data of it I will use pretty printer over here pretty printer is basically to see the JSON in a good format as you can see over here JSON is too cluttered it's not easy to understand so I will format the JSON and it will be pretty easier for everyone with us to understand the process so I hope you might have you might have understood like how fetch post how we use uh, HTTP request it's pretty easy and straightforward it's not too difficult to do to make the HTTP request so once it's done I will let you know how to do it then the thing only thing I want to show here the data which we are getting for the where it's happening where the earthquake happening let's use it has local area and everything in a same string just separated by a comma so what I will doing over yeah as you can see it's the title is showing the 0 0.2 to 21 kilometer north northwest of Amboy Washington so Washington is the like area and this Amboy is basically a nearby the local like local area which we want to show in application so what I will doing it I will be using a split function I will use the split function to split the string and show it into our application so let me do it and show it to you so what I will do for each because I want for the each tiles so I will make a list of string list of string okay then I will do places this is a variable name I've created a list of string places whether API dot feature index dot properties dot places dot split split we want to split it using comma so I placed comma over here so now we are having everything in this format and I will print places for you it will be easier for you to understand why I am doing this because I was getting all the like the full place I was to see now we get the California as the place and this is the local area where the earthquake has happened so this is why I have to this is why I am separating the comma so it's easier for us to understand it's easier for us to show it in our data so what I will do it over here now we will do places over here we'll call the places array places array and we'll call places start length minus one as we know the last is the mean the e main city is shown in the last thing and the local area we can show the places 
Kilo. Now that's it. So then, yeah, it's perfectly like we can see everything is shown in our application. It's working perfectly as you want it. So now what we'll do. Uh, I think we should trim it. I think it has a space in front and behind. That's why it's not aligning properly. Let's see what happens whether that. Yeah, I I thought correctly. Like it has, I had a space in front and behind, so I trimmed it. So it's perfectly aligned right now. So as you can see, we have got a data from internet and from the request and showed into our application. So let's yeah let's do one more thing we are done with the basic thing like what we wanted to do let's do something cool like making it good to see so let's make a list of colors and for each magnitude we should have a different color so how we should do it list of color it's not i'm just doing to make the, the ui looks good so we will use colors dot sorry 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 colors dot yellow comma colors colors dot green comma colors dot blue basically why i'm doing this suppose for one i want to choose yellow color for two if the magnet is one i will show the yellow color instead of red if the magnet is two i will show green color instead of red because every every magnet has the same color so let's change it it will look good that's what i'm doing right now colors dot orange comma colors dot dot red yep with this i made an array of colors so now we need to use the color in our application we have a to find that perfect yeah over here perfect so what i will do over here colors colors now what we'll do first we'll check again whether it has the magnitude what's the magnitude feature index start properties dot magnitude dot c and we'll check if it's greater than four then we will give the fourth color otherwise We'll use the whichever index the color. Put this. So I'll use this. Should we? Yes. W. Don't worry. It's not a big thing. Yeah. And I will do minus one over here because. Okay, because we are not doing zero, it's it will be zero point something. It will return into one. So that's why I have the minus one over here. And let's try and run it. Oh, what happened? What just happened? What is an error? Okay, not in the range zero to four, inclusive minus three. Okay. One more thing we need to check over here. If it's zero, we should give it zero. Thing happened like it turned into minus one four colon. I'll convert this whether API features make it zero. Sorry. A is equals to a is equals to zero. So now we will check if it's zero. Otherwise. Is control V minus one and we should make this in W. Uh, 
So now it's perfectly working as we have seen like I made the my it's giving a perfect color for two it's showing green for five it's showing red above four it's everything is red basically for one it's showing yellow and for three it's showing blue and for four it's showing orange so with this we are done with the flutter series thank you for watching the series welcome